in an experiment. So to make sure that uh, and our principal experimenters. So we welcome Kim to our school. We look very much forward to your, your course on this photography. You're welcome, Jeff. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you, Edgar. And um, uh, it's um, it's great to be here. And, and uh, it's interesting to try to do this in a hybrid way. So I hope that the people online uh, uh, can also get something out of this. And, and I guess uh, they can send questions. I can't see anybody online. So. Yeah, they, they, they can can, there's a chat and we will see if there's something. They can also ask questions like if you're in. Okay. Okay. Yes. So, um, okay. So, so uh, we have five days, uh, uh, about an hour and three quarters or something like that a day. And what? Yeah, I spent some time trying to think about how to how to do things. So, so as uh, Edgar mentioned, I got enough into control theory that um, ended up writing a book on it, and I taught a, a whole semester course. Um, so there's kind of like, I know how to give a, a, a one semester course on, on some of this material, and I know how to give a one hour sort of seminar. Um, this is something in between. And so I'm, you know, trying to kind of feel my way about what's the right way to present things so that we get far enough to be interesting, but not to make it just like a seminar where you tell people things that they're not really expected to necessarily understand how they're derived. So I hope I can actually teach some things. And also, I know that there's a, a, a range of levels. And so the, most of the examples, particularly at the beginning, and especially today, are going to be very simple. But the ideas behind them, I think, are interesting, even for people who are farther along. So the overall plan of what I wanted to try to do is today kind of give a little bit of an introduction to uh, uh, control theory and what we're going to sort of be talking about in general, um, and then talk about a specific kind of classic approach to control, which is for linear systems in the frequency domain, um, and to try to talk about some things that happened then. Uh, on so that, that that's for today. Uh, tomorrow um, we'll switch from the frequency domain to the time domain, and uh, there's a whole. It's, it's, it's a much more general approach, but it has a certain abstraction relative to the, the frequency approach that, that takes some getting used to. Um, and Wednesday, I want to give a brief introduction to a topic called optimal control. And Thursday, to talk about what happens when you have stochasticity. And I know there's already been a lot of discussion on that. So hopefully that will start to join themes that have been discussed. And my overall goal for, for Friday is that by the, the, the last half of it to present some recent work that we've done that makes use of a lot of the ideas that, that I'll be talking about. So, um, uh, and so I'm ho hopefully we'll get there um, in some fashion or other. Um, okay, so uh, just to uh, Begin. So the, the the book. This 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 is the <laughs> cover of the book, and that's kind of the overall reference I'm using. Um, it has, if you, if you go to my website here, um, there's a link to the to a page about the book, and then from there there's a link to Cambridge University Press uh, uh, title on it, and there there's some materials that you can download that might be helpful. Um, in particular. Um, there's there's two things. There's a set all, all the problems in the book, uh, for better or for worse, have solutions uh, on the web. So you can download the problems and the solutions, and some of those might be worth uh, uh, going through now or or, or later. Um, there's also a uh, kind of mathematical methods appendix that was too long to be in the book, or the book was too long to have the appendix. So that's also something that. Uh, um, can be downloaded and might again help if there's something specific that talk about where the MASH background is not as clear. Um, okay, so um, for just uh, uh, getting going, I, I, I wanted to start with a quote which um, I, I've always found very nice by Arthur C. Clarke, who was a science fiction writer. Um, probably most famous for 2001, 
uh, a space odyssey which was made into a movie in, the, in 1968 or something by Stanley Kubrick. Um, and he also had, he, he's also known for inventing the concept of the communication satellite. Um, I think it was about 1945, so somewhat before there were actual communication satellites and how this might work and why this was a, an important idea. Um, but the quote that I like is, is later, it's, it's uh, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Um, and what he means by this is that if you took any device, this tablet, your phone, a laptop, and you showed it to somebody 200, even 100 years ago, um, it would seem like magic, right? And how, how this works and, and particularly, you know, if it was before radio and just the idea that things are wireless, then I, I, I'm always impressed when, you know, I walk past somebody on the street and they're, they're talking into the, you know, some, some ear, earphone and mic and, but, you know, to the eye, they're just walking down the street talking to nobody. And, you know, 300 years ago, a person like that would be burned. So, <laughs> so things, things really change. And, um, but it also has another meaning, which is that, um, we can take complex technological objects like a car or uh, a computer um, and use it without realizing that there are a hundred different control loops and running underneath of it. That, that there's all this technology and it kind of is, is invisible until something fails catastrophically and you know a plane falls from the sky or uh, we got round two of people coming in. Yeah, can't worry. Okay, so not not that we haven't really done anything yet. Um, uh, so um so one of the things that I, I hope I can start to get across is that um, uh, control theory is something though that, I mean, it, it can be a very mathematical topic and, and the mathematics can get very difficult. Sometimes it can be not so difficult, um, but in some sense, the, 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 the math is not really the, the point of the exercise. And, and one of the things that's very interesting about control theory from the point of view of, of a physicist at least is that um, it's a different kind of way of thinking about things. So it's, it's dynamics with a, with a goal or a purpose. And that sounds a little trivial, but it changes a lot of things. And I think some of that I, I, I hope will kind of seep through in, in this week. Um, and, you know, by, by purpose, one can mean that there's a, you know, quote, intelligent design uh, of, you know, you, 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 you have somebody who's designing some object and, and puts in some you know, thermostat to regulate temperature and that's all done by you know, some supposedly intelligent designer. Um, and more subtly purpose can also kind of come in through evolution, both technological evolution. So that is, as devices go through different generations, they tend to converge on, on standard solutions. Um, and in biology, and I, I, I didn't mention that when I was talking about control loops and being invisible, but our body is also full of control loops that regulate gene transcription and blood pressure. And there's, there's sort of large scale physiological feedback loops in our body that keep our temperature constant and uh, regulate blood pressure and so forth. Um, and then there are uh, cellular level feedback loops that, that deal with gene expression and, and the control of the cell cycle and so forth. And again, those all kind of happen normally without our being aware of any of this. Um, and the way they work is subject to biological evolution. So all of this leads to a picture that's somewhat different from what we're used to thinking about in physics. And, um, and as I said, I hope this kind of comes through. So um, uh, what, um, what this gets applied to is you know, technology, um, if you're an experimental physicist, and I know there's at least uh, at least one, maybe maybe two uh, uh, here, then understanding control theory can help you do better experiments. Um, and 
um, more, but 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 the value of learning about control theory is not just if you're an experimentalist. What I also hope to convince you is that there's um, kind of conceptual value, this this dynamics with a purpose, um, but also other applications to physics. So so you can actually change sort of the the dynamical properties of physical systems and get materials and responses that are not natural in some sense. Um, uh, a classic example of this is, is the Paul trap in, in uh, atomic physics, where you, you can trap uh, charged particles with uh, rotating uh, um, fields and um, do experiments that would otherwise not be possible. Um, and as you've already seen, there are things such as, as Landauer's principle and Maxwell Demons, where the ideas of feedback and, and control enter at very fundamental levels within, within physics. Um, but also beyond that, in um, uh, the, the, the whole kind of quantum engineering movement of building quantum information systems, quantum computers, all of this depends on the control of quantum systems. So, so probably the most extensive kind of conceptual application of control recently has been in a sort of fancy control within quantum systems. Uh, and finally, there's the idea of controlling complex systems, complex networks, and that's also a topic that. That's there. Now, we don't have time to talk about all of these things, but I can touch on a few things here. And as I mentioned, in biology, there are um, control groups all over the all over the place and then all time scales. So um, that's kind of the general motivation to be a little bit more specific. Some of the goals that one might have in imposing control are regulation. So if you're an experimentalist, Often you want to keep a bunch of variables constant and then vary one parameter uh, uh, deliberately. And so, um, for example, if your many, many experiments uh, have effects that depend on temperature, and so whatever else you're studying, you want the temperature to stay constant. And it's roughly constant in the room, but you know people go in and out, and windows are open, and so forth. And so you might need to control temperature more precisely. So that's something that feedback control can do. Um, and that's kind of maybe the most simplest kind of uh, uh, application um, called regulation. You can also try to track a time varying signal. So you want a system to go through some, some, some path. And so you want to force it to not just regulate about a, a constant, but about a time varying path. And mostly that's what we'll talk about this, this week. Um, there are more subtle things, uh, you know, we'll be talking a little bit about dynamical systems, and I guess there's some other lectures uh, uh, starting, also starting today on dynamical systems. And so you'll learn about things like attractors and so forth. When you add feedback, you can change the attractor of the system and, and you can, you can you know, modify the properties, modify the type, and so you can kind of create the dynamics that you want. Um, another very nice application of control is to create collective phenomena where uh, uh, that wouldn't otherwise exist. So you can have different agents and you can start to add in interactions if they have sensing and so forth that interact. So this is, you know, this leads to active matter uh, uh, in you know, birds flocking and so forth, but you can also make artificial ones where the interactions are kind of programmed to use the control to, to create collective effects that wouldn't exist. So this can lead to synchronization, swarming, dancing, all sorts of things. Again, stuff we won't really have time to, to talk about. But, um, uh, okay, so um, uh, the first maybe basic notion is of a, a feedback loop. And these can occur in many different kinds of systems. I hope this, you know, this is at all visible, by the way. Yes. Okay, it's not, it's not doing anymore. Okay, so I'll try to try to put things higher. Um, so, um, yeah, there, there are different classes of, of feedback systems. So some, some of the oldest technological ones are what I would call gadgets. So uh, the one you probably know is the toilet where you, you know, pull a lever and, and you know, you flush it and the water goes down in the tank and then that opens up a valve and then it fills and then there's a ball. And when the, the water is high enough, the ball goes up and that shuts off the valve. Hopefully, sometimes it doesn't quite. Um, and that's a descendant of something called the, the steam engine governor, 
which is um, depicted here. This is my one sort of uh, historical application where um, this was developed by, among others, James Watt in Scotland in the 18th century. And this was a device to regulate the um, speed that a steam engine would, would turn at. And the idea is that as it rotates, let's see, so, so as it rotates here, these balls will feel a centrifugal force and they will go out. And when they go out enough, they're hooked up, you know, the, as, as they go out, they're hooked up to a lever. The lever will close a flap that cuts off the steam. So if it goes too fast, the flap starts to shut down and, uh, uh, and then that, that will take the steam engine to a, to a, to a, to a regular speed. Actually, sometimes it doesn't. Sometimes it kind of ends up being unstable and oscillating around. And uh, the first person to understand this was actually Maxwell, who wrote the first uh, theory paper in control theory in 1867, um, around the time he was doing 1868. It was but actually just about the time that he was uh, thinking about the Maxwell Demon experiment, which is kind of something on the conceptual role of feedback in a system, he was also thinking about the practical part of feedback. So it's, it's interesting that he, he actually sort of pioneered both aspects of control theory at roughly the same time, but I think completely disconnected in his mind. Um, uh, it's a long story about the, 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 why, why he got interested in the governor, but um, uh, anyway, so these are, these are what I would call gadgets. These are, these are devices, mechanical, and they're also biological ones. Uh, that just sort of function as feedback systems. And it's up to the viewer from the outside to understand what's the feedback part and, and so on. Actually, I, I didn't reproduce it, but in, in, um, in the book, I have the complete, this, this, this is a part of a steam engine, right? There's the whole rest of the boiler and the part of it. And it's an interesting thing to see the full diagram of the steam engine, because you see this complicated set of, of, of you know, cables and wheels and everything like that. And then off in the corner, there's this part here, which is the governor. But if you didn't know about it, it might take you a while to figure out how this engine worked and what was the function of this, this piece. And so, and similarly in biological systems, when we look um, at a molecular motor or things like that, it's, it's, it's a challenge to understand, you know, is there some kind of control system and how it's working and how it's, you know, quote unquote designed or evolutionarily designed. Um, there are also sort of um, large scale natural kinds of feedback. So like in the climate, the, one of the classic ones is, is um, uh, sea ice, which when it's present is white and tends to reflect light, so it keeps the water cool. But as it starts to melt, the sea, the water is effectively darker, absorbs more light and will tend to uh, warm things up more. So there's a kind of bi-stable situation where um, you can get positive feedbacks where you, you know, you have what we're experiencing now, which is that, that things start to melt, that makes the surfaces more absorbing, which makes things warmer, which makes them start to melt more. And so you, you drive between two different stable, unstable, or two different stable states with an intermediate instability. Um, and we'll, we'll see a little bit of that. Um, in the kind of more deliberate technological realm, there are both analog and digital control loops. So one of the big advances about 100 years ago was to sort of break things up into modules where you would have um, the system that you were interested in. You'd have an electrical circuit with a, an amplifier and a sensor. So the system would have a sensor and that would give in, a signal into a, a, an electrical circuit that would do the regulation. And then it would sort of take a decision and, and you know, output uh, another voltage, which would go to an amplifier and that would affect the system somehow. Um, in a more modern version of this, everything is digital. So you have the analog signals, which are digitized, turned into numbers, a computer with a program, which makes now some explicit decision, and then reconverts that digital answer into an analog signal, which is sent out to an amplifier and affects the system somehow. Um, so um, just to sort of set some concepts, um, uh, you know, when do we, have a feedback loop and, and, and when do we just have interacting variables? So if I have uh, um, two different systems, let's say X and Y, 
in some sense, a feedback loop is X affects Y and Y affects X. And so you set up a loop like that. Um, but, you know, there's the question, when would you think of this as sort of a feedback loop versus just a two variable system? You know, you could, you could take this X and Y and put it into a vector X and have it. So, so, so X here might obey dynamics. X dot is some F of X and it also depends on Y. Y dot is G depending on X and Y. And you could think of this as, a, as describing a feedback loop or you could just think of it as a coupled set of equations and you know, with, with, with a vector X instead of just two scalars. So when would you talk about a feedback loop and when not? It's a little bit a uh, semantic question, but, but usually you want some notion of autonomy that X and Y are somehow physically distinct systems that you can, and sometimes they're really just two separate things. Sometimes they're all part of one thing, but they have separate, separate roles that, you know, we're, as we saw here. Um, and there's some notion of causality that when X acts, it, you know, exerts something on Y, Y acts and exerts something on X. So there's this notion of, of a feedback loop, which is at least somewhat intuitive. Um, when you have two systems and they have this autonomy and, and separateness, um, then you can think of open loop interactions and closed loop interactions. So open loop interaction just means that, that one system affects another, but not vice versa. So you have a, a, a controller and it just does something and the system changes its behavior as a result. A closed loop system, uh, the, the controller affects the system, but then the system affects the controller. And that, that's the notion of feedback that, that the controller is being fed a measurement from the system. So this would be kind of like a, a thermostat that you know that detects that the room is too cold and then it tells the heater to come on. And so the sensor is the something that tells it the temperature of the room. And then the action that's being taken is uh, uh, to turn the heater on. And the decision, which is the third part of, of, of a feedback loop, would be, you know some rule like when it gets colder than such and such temperature, turn on the heater. And when it gets hotter than some temperature, turn it off. That would be a very simple uh, rule. Um, and finally, I, I don't think we'll talk too much about this, but one can make a distinction between autonomous and non-autonomous uh, dynamical systems. So, so for dynamical systems, this, this is just some state X changing in time. If it's F of X and there's no time, explicit time dependence, we would say it's autonomous and uh, um, non-autonomous, there would be some explicit variation in time. Um, so this is useful when you want to distinguish between feedback kind of imposed by a computer program, which measures something and then changes it. And so that change, as far as the system is concerned, is some outside time-dependent effect. Um, but if you saw the whole hardware as sort of one thing, you might think of it as an autonomous system that is just you know, it's fed in some, it's connected to reservoirs that can feed in some energy um, and it's, you know, exchange energy, for example, or, or, or particles to chemical potential, but otherwise it's internal dynamics and the controller and everything is sort of happening internally. Um, so uh, another distinction, which is sometimes useful is to think about a complex controller versus a simple controller. Um, so a complex controller would be something that's equivalent to a, a Turing machine and it can basically do anything. So a computer program, you know, a computer that was uh, a computer program to write control is can basically do anything. So that would be like a complex controller. Um, and then something simpler, maybe like a thermostat might, you know, where it's with like a bimetallic strip that can only do one thing, but that's also a controller. Okay, so um, that's kind of the, the philosophy. And before I, switch into uh, some actual actual material. This is a good place to, to stop and just if there are any, any questions before we really get going. Anything? I have a question from online. Uh -huh. Sure. Um, is there any uh, notion of uh, control or feedback uh, at the level of fundamental laws of uh, physics or biology? Let's say, um, you know, that, I mean, the real, the, you know, reductionist viewpoint of uh, the fundamental laws, not something we do in experiment or like that. Well, I, tell you, I mean, there, there, there are feedback 
you know, feedbacks that happen in natural systems. So as I mentioned, like, you know, the Earth's climate, um, you know, can be thought of as having various feedbacks. So that's not something that we impose and, and, and in biology, biological systems are there. So, so they exist not because necessarily we're, we're here. Um, whether you think of that as fundamental or not, I'm not, I'm not sure. So that, that arises because we are dividing the closed system into two pieces. One is the one we are interested in observing, and the other one is uh, some environmental bad. Is that right? Yes, but but so so we kind of make this classification, but but I guess it's it's, it's a useful classification. Um, I mean, there are places where you can sort of see this explicitly. So so if one is a, a kind of a more advanced comment, but if, if one, for example, thinks about um, uh, bipartite um, Markov dynamics of being like a master equation, so you can imagine having like four states, and, and depending on the, the rates, you can think of them as making a measurement or having a feedback loop. And in those cases, whether you think of it as just a four state system or two, two state systems can depend on things like the separations of time scales. So there are some, some simple cases where you can sort of see the emergence of this kind of separation between two different systems that you might think of as the working system and the control system. And, and, and in those simple cases, they can arise from things like, like disparities of time constants and so forth. Uh, otherwise, there are just, you know, as I said, there are, there, there are plenty of, of examples, both in biology and, and, and in um, geophysics, let's say, where it, it makes sense to think about feedback systems, where it's us who imposes this uh, kind of terminology. I see. So in, in elementary physics, uh, can I think of the the radiation back reaction uh, as a kind of feedback control situation where electron radiates and then it affects the motion of electron itself. I, yeah, I suppose. I mean, I guess one of the questions is you can, you can make these interpretations and then is it, is it useful to think of it that way or not? As opposed to say gapping or something like that. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, so um, to try to put some, 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 be a little more concrete and, and uh, get into the material. So I want to start with. Um, oh, I'm sorry. And the other chats. And the chats. I don't have time. Just a second. Everybody is showing with respect to feedback. So, so the question is whether, um, you know, what, when and how do we decide if it's a feedback loop? So the, the, I mean, I think one thing is that this is, this is a point of view that's being imposed from the outside. And so the one question is just, is this a useful thing to do? Um, <clears throat> I mean, as I said, sort of some of the elements that you would want would be that the with two parts that you're decomposing the system into a, a controller, a physical system that's being controlled, and then the controller, you know, these should have some kind of autonomy and there should be some causal interactions between them. So if you have that, then this might be a useful way to, to do, but otherwise it's really just, it's, it's, it's we're the ones put, making this classification. And many times this is a very useful thing to do. Um, Again, in technology, this is often very deliberately done and very obvious and you've got your system and then you put a sensor on it and then you hook it up to a, something called a controller and you put a wire into it and another wire coming back to an amplifier. So all of those elements really like you can point to, you know, this box and this box and this box and it's connected by that wire. And in those cases, it's, it's uh, clear. And then there are many cases in nature where you look at it and you say, okay, it makes sense to call this a feedback system. So the, the, the climate feedbacks, for example, um, other cases, it might be a little more complicated. And as I said, in, <clears throat> I think in, in biological systems in particular, sometimes the challenge is understanding is, is there something really being actively controlled or not? And it's not an obvious thing. Is it a question here? Or here? Yeah. Is, that, is that good? Uh, 
Okay. If no complaints, we can okay. Right. Okay, so let's start in a in a simple place, um, partly to to fix some concepts and notation. <clears throat> so think about a, a a pendulum as a kind of prototypical dynamical system. So you can think of a balance of torques uh, um, leading to a, a second order uh, nonlinear equation. Um, one of the things that's often useful to do in control theory, but in dynamical systems and so forth, is to work in dimensionless variables that are appropriately scaled. So you want to find, um, for example, here, time is a physical, we, we, we have, uh, uh, well, we can we can divide through by the mass, and that that's um, that's clear. And divide through by length squared, and this we define as a, a square of an angular frequency. But we still have time as an explicit variable, and we can get rid of that by defining a dimensionless variable t bar, which is a magnet times tau. So this is time one over time. So t bar is dimensionless. Change variables, and so when we change variables, the omega squareds will will There'll be an omega squared here, and it's put into here, and it cancels out, and so we're left with a dimensionless equation. I will usually be pretty sloppy and go back to the same notation that I started with. So the the dots here are the you know they're, they're the original time variable, but now scaled. Um, and so we can write this. You know, initially we had mass, we had length, we had time, uh, we had gravity. And eventually, we're getting down in this case to uh, um, an equation with no no three parameters. And so that's one of the advantages. The other is that that um, numbers have you know kind of absolute meaning, whereas the numbers when you have units don't. You can you know something that is um, a meter, it's one meter, or it's ten to the minus three kilometers, or ten to the nine nanometers. You know, so the number when you have units doesn't have any absolute sense, but but when you have ratios, then you do. Okay, um, it's also useful to um, put everything in a kind of standard format. So I'll, every everything I'm going to be talking about, I'll assume that can, it can be reduced to some kind of system that is of the form x dot where x is some vector equals some f of x where f is a uh, a vector function. And in this case, we can do this very simply by defining uh, a two component vector x1 equals theta, x2 equals theta dot. And so then we can put um, you know, this, this equation into a first order form like here. And then we call this x and we call this f of x. And we have this, this standard form here. Um, OK, so I hope this is something that, that um, you, you've all seen before in some in some fashion. Um, now, the, the point of view of control theory has what seems like just a slight modification of this, but it ends up being important. And that is that, that when you open up a, a, a many physics text and dynamical systems text, they would talk about equations of this form. But in control theory, we add inputs and outputs. We, we explicitly think about how you you know, what, what you can learn about the system, which might not be all of that, it could be, but, but often isn't, um, and what you, how, how you affect it. And so we add inputs, which I'll call U, and I think it tra actually traces back to the Russian for control. So if any Russian speakers here, they, I, I forget what it is in Russian, but it, it starts with a U. And outputs uh, Y. Um, and so what we end up with is, a set of equations x dot, which is a function now of both of, of x, but now we'll have some explicit inputs u, and the outputs of it will be uh, uh, some y, which can be in general some nonlinear function of x and possibly u as well. I have a question. I don't know how to, the difference between the x and y. I mean, uh, the output the output must be as part of the system state. Or no, no, not necessarily. No, not necessarily. Okay. Correlated with the system state, but not necessarily. Okay. Right. Often it is, but but it doesn't have to be. Okay. Okay. Right. We'll, okay. So we'll see we'll see some examples of how this works. Okay. And 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 a feedback would be, you know, drawing on the whys. You know, give, given the whys, how do you construct the u? Okay. 
that would be a, a, a feedback system, for example. Okay. Um, and often, both for simplicity and for other reasons that we'll get into, we'll be thinking about linear dynamics. Uh, the, the simplicity is that we can we know how to treat linear systems very well mathematically, so that's a good that's a good starting point. So, for example, in this pendulum, we can imagine looking at his behavior in the vicinity of the down equilibrium, where theta naught and theta naught dot. So this is x one and x two are both zero. So our, our initial state x naught is zero zero, and uh, uh, and then if you linearize the equations about that, and we'll we'll, we'll see how in just a moment. Um, we can write this as a, as a matrix equation for x1 and x2, and I'll, I'll talk about this in, in, in a moment. Um, when you linearize, it, the result that you get depends on um, uh, where you are. So, so for example, in, in, in the system state space, so x I'll call the, 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 the state vector, and the, the vector space that x lives in will be the state space. In physics, we would talk about um, phase space quite often. Um, so in there, there you would have position and momentum variables. Here, it could the, the state vector could be the set of Qs and Ps from 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 positions, coordinates, and generalized momenta, um, or positions and momentum. Um, but there could be other things too. So uh, uh, we'll just we'll just talk about a state state space and state vector. Um, so um, uh, yeah, so so in in particular for the for the pendulum, we can add a, you know if we if we rewrite the, the the equation here and add a u of t to the right, we're saying we can apply a, a, a torque to it, and um, and so then uh, and and for the output of the system the y's we could say that well we maybe we measure the 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 angle of the pendulum. But the complete state actually requires both the angle and the velocity, and and typically you, you actually can there are, there are devices that will will directly measure velocity, um, but typically people often don't use that. They might measure just just the position, and so in this case here the y so this is a specific uh, uh, example would be you know if this is the state vector here then y would be a, a row vector one zero that picks out x one um, and not x two. Uh, so that's a very simple, simple example of H. Okay, um, so linear systems, as I said, will often be dealing with them. So the the um, they they have a form of you can put it as x dot equals a x plus b u. So so the f of x is being essentially Taylor expanded. We'll, uh, you know, maybe I should have put that first, but we'll we'll get to that. Uh, uh, in a moment, so that the first term is x. If we if we assume x equals zero is an equilibrium, then the first term would be a x. Yeah. Uh, suppose uh, I have no linear system, and uh, my question is, what does it mean whenever I am applying the uh, linear theory to analyze the nonlinear system? Can 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 make sure you on hold for for like ten minutes, and we'll get to that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and maybe I think for people who like the abstract thing first, I should have inverted the presentation, but we'll we'll do we'll do some examples first and then and then go back to the visualization. Okay. Maybe I should have done it backwards. Um, okay, so just but just to again maybe think of it as setting notation. So um, so x is an n-dimensional state vector, and so a x dot equals a x a would be an n by n matrix. U would be an input, but it could also, in general, be several inputs. And so, if it was several inputs, maybe M of them, then you would need a matrix B to to, to connect that and output uh, the effects of the the inputs U on the state X. So B would be an M by N matrix. And similarly, you might have more than one. You might measure more than one thing on it, and so you would have Y would be say P components, and it would be connected. By some matrix C that went from from n components to, to p output n inputs to p outputs, so a, a p by n uh, matrix. Uh, you, and and if it were affected by the inputs, which is sometimes does happen, um, then you need to go from from the number of inputs to the number of outputs. So it would be a, a m by n or m by p matrix. 
Um, you can actually sort of fit these all into some giant uh, uh, um, matrix that's n, n plus p by n plus m, just as a kind of, it was it's sometimes an efficient way to store a linear system in a computer program, but it's also kind of a, just a, a visualization of the inputs and outputs. Um, so, so to give an example of what this language looks like for some simple things that, that, that you've already seen, if you have like a, a, a low pass filter circuit, uh, an RC electrical circuit where you have a time dependent voltage in and time dependent voltage out, a resistor, a capacitor, then the uh, dynamical equations or the, the time derivative of V out is, is you can show, I, I hope you've seen this, um, minus one over RC V out. And then uh, um, if V in itself is a, is a um, uh, time dependent uh, uh, input would, would also affect be the driving term here. Again, we can scale it. And when you scale it, it takes the simple form X dot is minus X plus U. So we, we've gotten rid of the RC as a, as a unit of time, tau, we call tau RC, and then we scale it just the way we did before. And so in this sorry, language here, John, yeah. can you repeat again the circuit because for me. Oh, okay, sorry. I, I sorry. forgot a lot of the electricity electric mm -hmm. Okay. And then we have the, the okay. So time. so 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 V in is a time dependent voltage in. Okay. And so there's a uh, um, so we have okay, do this on the fly, but V in minus V out. <laughs> well, uh Sorry? No, I have like a voltage divider. Yeah, you can think of it as a voltage divider, except that we're dealing with 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 um, AC signals. And so we have impedances. And so the impedance, so it's a voltage divider between R and C, but the, the impedance of, of this is just R, but the impedance of this is uh, one over I omega C. And so there's a, a frequency dependence uh, a voltage divider. That's a useful. Point. It is to you, but I don't know what it is. I think so. I think so. Um, and uh, so, so this is a typical. This is the simplest example of what's called a, a low-pass filter. So um, we'll we'll see in a moment. But what it basically does is let uh, low frequencies through and filters out and reduces the amplitude of high frequencies. Um, so we'll get to that in a moment. But just as an equation of motion. Um, it has x dot is is uh, minus x plus u. So so in this in this language of of you know having a b c d, the a is just uh, minus one. Okay, so it's just everything's a scalar here. B is is plus one, and c is plus one, and there's no d. Okay, so this is this is kind of mapping you know a physical equation that you you you, you can probably easily derive. To this language of, of linear systems with an explicit A matrix for the dynamics, a B matrix for the inputs, a C matrix for the output, and, and sometimes a D matrix to couple. If, if, the, in, if the input couples through to the output, then uh, uh, we have that. But you usually we don't. Um, the second order version, which we kind of already talked about. So if we had like a, a damped harmonic oscillator, which in scaled units would be you know, Q double dot plus two zeta, zeta would be a dimensionless damping coefficient, uh, one for, for critical damping, less than one, between zero and one for underdamped, one is critical damped and overdamped when it's greater than one. Um, and then this is again, the driving input. We rewrite this as a second order equation. Now it's the same as we had before. There's now the damping term here. That's our A matrix. The B matrix is, this, is, is zero one because the U is affecting uh, uh, the equation for d by dt of q, it's you know, q double dot is d by dt of q dot, which is d by dt of x1, uh, and, uh, or d by t of x2, sorry. And so, so it enters in as a zero one. If we observe the velocity of uh, position, as I mentioned before, c will be the row vector one zero, and then again, b is zero. Um, so, so this is again mapping um, something that you, Already seen onto this this language of of um, kind of engineering systems theory. Okay, so um, you know again, why study uh, uh, these linear systems? Um, 
one is that they're easy. And so this is the, um, you know, why do you search for your, when, you, when you've lost something, why do you search for your key, when you've lost your key or something, why do you search for it under streetlight? Well, that's where you can see. And so um, uh, these are the equations that we can easily solve. Um, however, even in um, uh, cases where you have nonlinear dynamics, we'll see a lot of cases where we're looking at two dynamical systems that each are nonlinear, but they're almost the same. And so the deviations, the differences between them are small and can be approximated by linear systems. So even something that starts out as linear can be thought of as nonlinear. The other reason is it turns out that, that when you have a linear control system, it can be robust against lots of kinds of perturbations. And you can think of the nonlinear terms sometimes as perturbation. So if it's not so strongly nonlinear, some of the nonlinear effects will just be uh, lumped into various kinds of disturbances that hit the system. And so again, you can use linear systems to think about it. So they're, so linear systems are more, um, they're, they're certainly simpler, but they're also more realistic than you might, might initially think, or they can be. Okay. Um, so, um, so yeah, how do you get from nonlinear systems to linear ones? So, so, so basically you're just Taylor expanding. So if we start with a system X dot equals F of X and U and Y is some function nonlinear in general of H of X and U. So this is the readout, which doesn't have to be linear. Um, then if there's a, a, a fixed point, this is particularly easy to, to understand. So if there's an X naught and U naught where um, uh, that, are, that are fixed points, then F of X naught and U naught is zero and H of X naught and U naught is some, some, some reference value. And so then we can expand everything in small deviations around the X naught, U naught, and Y naught. And um, if F is, is differentiable, then, then we can carry out a Taylor expansion. And then these A's are just the, the, the DF dx evaluated at the fixed point X naught, U naught, and, and B is DF du, and so on. So uh, can you repeat again what is X zero? X zero depends on time. No, X naught is 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 the fixed point. is a fixed point. So X naught and, and U naught are defined as by being fixed points. So so they're solutions that are independent of time. Again, this is just the simplest case. You can, you can do fancier linearizations. Um, and again, the control that you need. So you imagine that there's some U naught that will fix X naught. So so again, if I go back to the temperature thermostat temperature in the room. X could be the, the, the temperature of the room. X naught is the sort of stationary point. U naught is the heater. You know, let's do this in winter. The heater that is um, the amount of heat that's necessary to heat it up to, 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 to X, a temperature X naught. And so then everything is stationary. But of course, in general, the temperature is varying and so forth. And the, the heater can turn on and off. But people are so sure of their system. <laughs> yeah. And so then we linearize it about that. And, um, uh, and so there it's clear that, that, for example, a different value of U naught will lead to a different value of X naught. And usually it's not a linear, not necessarily a linear value. So you have some knob that you're turning on the heater and you just turn it to some value and you measure the temperature of the room that it comes to. And maybe that's linear, but maybe it's not linear, but where, where, whatever it is, you can, um, you can look at small deviations about it and describe those by linear dynamics. Okay, so once we have this sort of linear systems point of view, it's, it's very natural, particularly for the case where things, the systems have um, time independent components so that the A's and D's and C and D, those in principle could still be, they could be time dependent and still have a linear system. But in the simplest case, they're not. And so, then it makes sense to think about things in frequency space. And so as physicists, we would naturally just look at the Fourier transform. Engineers tend to look at the Laplace transform, but in the but with a complex variable. So you would define f of s um, to be the, the integral from zero to, to infinity uh, over time of f of t, the, the time dependent signal f of t, e to the negative s t, and think of this as an operator L acting on f. Um, and 
uh, and if f and if s is complex, then uh, there's not too much difference between the Laplace transform and the Fourier transform. Um, again, just in case anybody does encounter engineering discussions, I'll I'll do this in terms of the Laplace transform. Um, but uh, uh, one can easily convert to a Fourier transform. So in the Laplace domain, then the relationship between y the output and u the input, um, we can we can take the output y of t and take its Laplace transform and get y of s. So I'll, I'll I'll be a little bit loose and just if I say y of t and y of s, of course the the y's are different functions in the two different domains, but we can sort of think of a kind of more general notation where y is some object and it has a, a time representation, it has an s plane complex s plane representation, and so I'll use the same name for all of them, but but Functionally, they're, they're different functions. Um, and so we can take the, the, the output y and take its Laplace transform and take the input u and take its Laplace transform. Uh, and then since these are now for, for let's, in the simplest case, y is a, a scalar signal and u is one input, then g, uh, then, 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 then y of s and u of s are, are um, also scalar functions. And so we can take their ratio and g of s, the ratio is called the transfer function, or sometimes the physics version would be the dynamical response function. Um, and so it is a complex number because we're, we're, we have a complex variable S. And so G of S is complex. It has a magnitude and a phase. And if we think about S, if we, if we substitute S equals I omega, then we'll have, again, up to limits, you know, zero to infinity instead of negative infinity to infinity, we'll have a Fourier transform. And so we can think of the, the, the frequency response and the phase response of the system. So the magnitude of G of I omega for your transform will be the, the magnitude of uh, the magnitude response. And we can also talk about a phase response. And pictorially, this is all very simple. So pictorially, we have uh, an input sine wave at some frequency. And then we measure the output, the red one here. It, because it's a linear system, the output will have the same frequency as the input, but the amplitude will be different. And the ratio of amplitudes of, you know, the amplitude of the output to the amplitude of the input, that's G of S evaluated at this particular omega. Um, and then the phase shift between the two, which is shown here, is, is the phase shift at that frequency. Um, so, uh, we can apply this, for example, to our, our second order system. Um, and if we have uh, the situation where the, the what's being measured is the position, then it's, it's y double dot plus two, two zeta y dot plus y is u of t. You take the Laplace transform. Remember, every time you have a, a, a time derivative, you'll bring down a power of s. Um, with a Fourier transform, there'd be an i omega. So in that sense, Laplace is a little bit easier. You just bring down a power for every derivative. And so this becomes you know, S squared plus and this becomes S. And, and then if we take the inverse of it here, we'll have one over one plus two zeta S and this is the S squared. Okay, so this is, um, we've, we've sort of taken the input output behavior. So we have the dynamics plus the structure of the input plus the structure of the output. And that gets summarized by this one function G of S. For example, yeah. the question, oh. I, I cannot see the second term in the question. So, sorry, uh, this is there. So, two times rho. Uh, zeta. Ah, zeta. Okay. Yeah. Okay. okay. That's my, that's zeta. my attempt at zeta. Sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. Because I was confused with the. No, not enough. Not enough. Sorry. So, zeta is just a damping parameter. Uh, uh, Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, uh, maybe I. One question. Uh, Fourier transform or Laplace transform? Uh, which one is preferred? Why do we use when do, do we use Fourier? When do we use Laplace? Why is it so common in control theory to use Laplace transform instead of Fourier? Well, as I said, if, if so, if if you think of Fourier transforms and Laplace transforms of real arguments. Then, then, then you could answer this question. You know, there there are some advantages. You know, like like Laplace, you have initial value. It's sensitive to initial values, and 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 so if you have an initial time, that can be useful. Um, but if you allow the arguments to be complex in both cases, and the convergence properties are different, um, 
But if you allow the arguments to be complex, there isn't that much difference. And so then I would just say it's cultural that, that physicists often use uh, uh, Fourier transforms and engineers often use Laplace transforms. But and essentially, the, the whole control theory can be made from all the Fourier transforms. Yeah, yeah. So when you start to describe things the way I'll describe in, 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 you know, in the um, complex S or omega plane, they're rotated by 90 degrees. So there's a, there's a literal point of view, but, but it doesn't matter too much. Okay. Yeah, you had a question. Okay, well, that was very efficient. Okay. Fully, if I value and only the system as it goes, the Right. So, again, this is, this is all most useful for linear time invariant systems. So, once you have even time varying dynamics and your non linear terms, then this approach is less useful. So, so, this is kind of a starter approach. Historically, it was kind of a starter approach, too, because it was the kind of the first one. At least in the West, that was that was uh, thought about. Uh, I, have, uh, I have another question. Applying linear systems in the or the nonlinear system, we are uh, actually removing some of the nonlinear feature for the, of the system. So, how much extreme uh, it is useful to apply the linear system to on a nonlinear system? Well, again, I think that's something that the answer I hope will kind of emerge as we go through the the the, the week. Um, yeah, you know, some, sometimes more useful than you might think, and sometimes it, it doesn't work, I guess, is that's the yeah, short answer. Something doesn't work on a strongly non-linear system. Yeah. Yeah. So 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 there are some situations where it's sufficiently non-linear. And we'll talk about an example, I think mostly on Wednesday, where um, you know, so so instead of having a pendulum, I mean I, I partly introduced the pendulum because I want to then put it on a cart and have a cart carry the pendulum. And that turns out to be kind of a more intrinsically nonlinear system where linearization doesn't work. Yeah, um, uh, what would be the process or what would be the method to get rid of this features? To get rid of? Of this features. Or we cannot apply, or we cannot apply the linear system to the nonlinear system. Well, I guess, I guess, okay, so so again, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but you know, so 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 this pendulum that I introduced, if you control it with a torque. It's not so different from a linear system, actually, it turns out. If you control it by putting it on a cart and pushing it back and forth, it is. So you might not think that that's a very, you know, that sounds a little bit weird, but two systems, you know, depending on how I hook up the motor, can be either basically linear or essentially nonlinear. Um, but we'll see why that happens. Um, and so, yeah, in, in one case, if you, you know, with this, if you ignore the nonlinearities, then you're severely constrained in what you can do, and some things become impossible. Um, whereas if, if you're controlling with a, with a torque, then there isn't that subtlety. So basically all the things become possible with more or less of a linear theory. So it's it's a subtle, it's a subtle thing. Okay. Um John, this is great interruption. You've done one hour of course. If you would like to do a break, short break, you could do not really important. Well, it's originally finishing. Then there's one other subject. Ah, okay. Sorry. Then we go. We'll go and then we'll have a break unless, again. Unless you want. Okay, because I need a. Oh, 30 or 45. I'm talking 45. But I, but I, yeah. Uh, Well, maybe we start a little bit late, but yeah. You are true. You are going to have 45 and you must do to do it from the Okay. So um, that we finish at the uh, top of probably 11 50, and 50 or even 55. So if you want, you can do it the break. They say count by 45 with the budget. But... Right. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm fine. If, if, if people want to take a break, or I, I mean, I, I was hoping that we would take a break kind of in the mix, a little bit further along, not, not a break, but something where maybe okay. people could try to do a, a little calculation on their own. Um, okay, so um, so there are a number of, of graphical tools for linear systems that are useful to know about. One of them is called Boda plots, um, where you just take the log of the, the magnitude. So these are magnitude and phase response. So you take the log, tradition is the log of the magnitude versus the log of the frequency. So for a second order system, for example, if it's underdamped, 
you have something like this with the resonant peak. If it's over uh, uh, critically damped and over damped, it would not have a peak. Um, and then you can look at the phase response. Again, for a second order system, this would go from, the, if we have a linear variable pi here from zero to minus pi. So a phase lag of pi passing through pi over two at, at, at resonance, uh, again, plotted on, on a log frequency scale. So these are, um, the log scale is because you want to look at frequencies over many orders of magnitude and responses over many orders of magnitude. Um, you can look at this in the complex plane and characterize the plane by the, the, the complex poles. So this will have zeros in the, the, the denominator will have zeros at different points S in the complex uh, S plane. And so we can put all of those zeros there because it's in the denominator, it makes them blow up and they're called poles. And so we put these poles, for example, for an underdamp system, we get a pair of complex conjugate poles. And so they might look like this. So in this case here, stable systems are all have negative values of the real part of, of, of the linear part. So stable systems would live in this, this half of the plane. And if they're complex, um, because the coefficients are real in the transfer function, um, you know from the fundamental theorem of algebra that, that the roots would come in, a fundamental theorem of algebra that the roots would come in complex conjugate pairs. Um, if it's overdamped, then you'll have two real roots. And so they'll be on the, you know, the imaginary part is zero. So there'll be two points here. And then you can follow as a function of zeta, for example, the evolution of these poles. And so you would see that they would kind of go like this, like this, and they would meet at critical damping when you have two degenerate roots, and then they would split and form a very quick, you know, quickly damped one and a slowly damped one. And again, this is characteristic of overdamped dynamics. And, and, and I think if you've taken intermediate level mechanics course or something like that, you would see these three cases of damping. Um, you can also plot the, um, the, the, the transfer function itself in the complex plane. And so then um, as a function of frequency, for example, in the second order system um, at uh, low frequency, the phase is zero, so it's in phase. And so it's got a real response here. Um, and then at, at intermediate frequencies, the, um, uh, we'll, we'll have imaginary parts of it become important. And so the actual system will trace out something like this and at infinite frequency, the magnitude goes to zero. And so it, it, it both real and imaginary parts go to the origin. And so this is called a Nyquist. This is called, the first one is called a pole zero plot. And this is called a Nyquist plot. The, Nyquist and Boda were early theorists at Bell Labs, the uh, uh, company, the, 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 the telephone and telegraph company in, in the US that where a lot of this kind of theory was, was developed in the 1920s and 30s. Um, you can apply this to nth order systems. And so then G would have a denominator that's an nth order polynomial. Um, and at very high frequencies, the leading term would be S to minus N. And so this would correspond to a phase of, of minus I to the N times omega to the N. So the, the amplitude would be going down by omega to the N. Um, and uh, uh, there would be a phase lag of, of um, so I corresponds to a phase lag of, of, of my side corresponds to a phase lag of pi over two. And then if you add that to the nth power, that would be n times pi over two. So a first order system has a phase lag of pi over two. A second order, as we've just seen, has a phase lag of, of pi 180 degrees. Third would be you know, three pi over two and so forth. Um, and in general, the, 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 the transfer function can also have polynomials in the numerator. So it could be functions of the input as well. And so then one would speak of a, like a, a kth order numerator and an nth order denominator and a relative order of, of n minus k. And then everything I talked about would, would, would apply to the relative order and not to the order. Um, and uh, if, if, if it's a system the way I just described, where the transfer function is the ratio of two polynomials, it's called a rational transfer function. But not all transfer functions fall into that class. So there are ones that are you know, sort of like irrational ones or not rational. Um, so the simplest example is a time delay. So if you take the Laplace transform of a function that is delayed by some tau, 
then it's easy to show that this is e to the negative s times tau times the Laplace transform of the undelayed system. And so the transfer function then just becomes e to the negative s tau, or if you scale it, e, uh, e to the negative s tau. And so that's not the ratio of two polynomials. Um, and we'll, 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 I wanted to kind of get to an example using this. So something that's a little like this, but different, and maybe we can work through the details uh, in a moment, would be if you have a, a one-dimensional rod with a heater. So here's a one-dimensional rod going off to infinity here. We put a heater here, and we put a temperature probe some distance x down the rod. And then we monitor the temperature here in response to changing the power into the, into the rod. And so you can work out, and maybe we will in a moment, um, that the transfer function for this is e to the negative square root of s over square root of s. And again, this is something that's not the ratio of two polynomials. So spatially extended systems and systems with delays and things like that can have transfer, still have transfer functions, but they're not a rational polynomial. And this actually has some physical consequences that I'll get to in a moment. Um, okay. Uh, just so, so one of the advantages of working in frequency space is that you can take a bunch of simple system, simple linear systems and easily build up more complex ones. Um, and, and the basis of this is the convolution theorem. So uh, you, you might remember this for Fourier transforms, but it also works for Laplace transforms that there's a convolution theorem. So the convolution is, is, is this integral here. So between two functions, G and H, and gives you a third function F. And so it's G of T prime, H of T prime minus, minus T. And so this defines an f of t. And so the Laplace, the, the, the uh, uh, convolution theorem in this context is that the Laplace transform of the convolution of these is just the product of Laplace transforms. Um, and so this is very useful to building up complicated systems because you know, we talked about a system having an input and an output, but now imagine we have two systems where the output of the first system is the input to the second system. And so now we can kind of put them together uh, and and um, an example would be having some uh, uh, sensor dynamics. So we've talked about our second order system as an example, but imagine instead of um, measuring uh, the, I've, I've, I've changed names to, uh, is this a V or a new, I don't know. Anyway, let's call it new. So new is the, the variable that's obeying second order dynamics but we can't measure it directly, but we measure it with some sensor that itself has some dynamics. And this is actually what happens in a real sensor. Um, not, nothing can sense anything instantaneously. And so we actually then have two transfer functions and it kind of looks like this, where we have mu in terms of u, that's our original system here. And so this has this transfer function that we've already talked about, but y is a first order system. We've also talked about that, that this transfer function and because of the convolution theorem, if one is feeding into the other, then the transfer function from u then goes to this intermediate variable nu, and then to this final variable y, we can go from u to y directly just by multiplying the two transfer functions, okay? And in the time domain, this would be a convolution, but in the, in the frequency domain, it's just the multiplication of these two transfer functions. So the transfer function of the combined system is just the product of a first order one and a second order one. So it's, so it's very simple. And the convolution uh, like contains the causality you know, of the of the signal tra uh, transferring. No? I mean, yeah. Like the causality. Yeah. So these are these are. Uh, we won't have time to really. I mean, there's a whole subtle story about causality, and for those who know about kramers kronig relations, um, you know part of the story. And it turns out that that in control theory. Um, the most useful form of the kramers kronig relations that relates the real and imaginary parts of, of transfer functions to each other. And in control theory, it's actually more useful to look at the polar form of that. So you take the magnitude and the phase, because we look at magnitudes and phase, but it turns out that, that there's also a, it's called a Bode relation, uh, but, but the, 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 I'm sorry? Can you repeat the name? Bode, B-O-D-E. Um, so it's, it's, it's the game phase theorem. So um, there's a, a, a relationship between the magnitude and the phase, just as there is between the real and the imaginary part. The subtle point, and again, sorry, I'm, I'm gonna speak for, <laughs> I guess, the restricted part here. 
is um, that whereas the Cromwell's point of view relations are equalities, the Bode relationship is actually an inequality between the magnitude and phase lag because you, you can always have a system and add more delay, but there's, there's a minimum delay that you can't go below. Okay, but, but you can always add some extra delay. Like you can always have a signal that just is a loop of a wire that goes for 10,000 kilometers in the speed of light. And it, you know, it just takes a while for things to happen. Um, and that will delay the system without necessarily changing anything else. Okay, so you can always just add extra phase delay without affecting the magnitude. But if you don't have that, then there's a minimum phase delay that's implied by the way the magnitude varies with the frequency. So that's the more useful version of it for control. But that was one of the things I kind of jettisoned, unfortunately. Okay, can you think about the stretch of the model, the time domain? So, so oh, here. Yes. So what does this model have in the equation, the stretch of the equation that implies that you can do this, this type of uh, product in, in the past? Day? So it, it must be a model of a given class, no? Yeah, so it's linear models with uh, time invariant coefficients. coefficients for the linear system. Yes, yes, yes. So, like the the zeta here is, you know, the, the damping could depend on time, right? Yes. Um, the new in the second sometimes I get lost with the steam The new in the second equation is, is, the, is, same. is the same new here. I see. So, okay. so, so, so instead of measuring, so before I said, you know, like before I said, well, really the internal variable is like this x. And then we have a y, and I said, well, if y is equal to x, then I'll just replace it. But that implicitly meant that I had a sensor that was infinitely fast, and whatever x did, y would respond instantly. Uh, and then I'm saying, sort of more realistically, a sensor takes some time, and so it's characterized by some some time constant, which actually I haven't been very. I mean, usually there would be an explicit tau here that was, you know, different from from one once you fixed the scaling here. It would be like an adaptation time. At the center, yeah. I see. Okay. Um, Other questions? Okay. So, um, so, so the frequency discussion is, is, is intuitive, but again, it's very restricted because it, it, it's this class of linear time invariant uh, systems. Okay. Um, so let's try, to, let's try to do something slightly less uh, uh, that, that uses all of these um, uh, concepts. Um, so imagine now we're going to construct a feedback loop where we have two systems. One's now going to be thought of as a controller. So forget about the sensor issue for the moment. So we have our physical system G of S, which might be like a linearized pendulum. And now we're going to add in another system that's going to control it. And we'll do it by measuring, taking this Y output and forming a difference between a reference signal, which we want to follow, which could be a constant or it could be some time varying, Laplace transform of a time varying signal. Um, and we'll look at the error in frequency space. And so we'll construct this sort of feedback loop here. And what I want to find, or what we, we should try to find is what is the transfer function connecting R to Y when we have this feedback, okay? So the, again, the cast of characters are G is the system, K is the controller, Y is the output of G, but now under control. U is the internal input. So it's the, it's the output of the controller, but it's the input to the physical system. R is the reference. And E is going to be the difference R minus Y. And, and this is kind of the negative error signal. And the negative sign is, is, is a kind of a convention. So I'll, I'll mostly stick with that. OK, and so the, the, the I mean, the, 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 the problem here, and, and maybe this is something that we can take two minutes to, to try to do, is to work out what, this, what, what, what the transfer function from here to here is. Um, so I don't know if this is something that you guys want to take a break and try to do for, for five minutes. OK, so when you're doing it, remember that, um, so like this relationship here means that u is k times e, OK? Um, y is g times u, okay? And then the input here, the error is r minus y. So if you put all of that together and just solve 
for y in terms of r, then one should come up with something. Sorry, could you repeat the, the relations between the variables? So, it's just, so the relations are, are, are just uh, uh, kind of just what you see. So, so here's K. Okay, so it's it's a dynamical system too. It's the controller dynamics. Yeah. And so it takes an input E and an output U. So then oh, U okay. equals KE. Okay. Right. And you, you know, in other words, KE is the the the, the product of two Laplace transforms, convolution and time domain, and so. That, that produces the quote unquote output u, but u is then the input g. Right? Okay. Well, it, it becomes a little because one person's output is another person's input. Okay, okay. And then you take the difference. And... Yeah. Okay. okay. So you put them all together, and what you want to do is, is solve for y equals something times r. E, e is r minus y or y minus y? Yeah, well, okay. In control theory, it's usually defined as r minus y. You can think of it as as as, as a, yeah okay it's just yeah it's just a, it's a sign convention so it's it, yeah it's the negative of what we would call the error. The arrows have a meaning in the flow coming in. The arrows are kind of the signals of 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 are, are going in you know this direction. So each of these systems here, the G, like the input is on the left and the output is on the right. The input of the controller here is this, and the output of the controller is on the So that if they think that the house is out, but we are doing like an exercise. That <laughs> no, that it's that the house The goal of the exercise is to write the y in terms of a function of a function of a yeah, a linear function. Okay. Yeah, in terms of the functions k, in terms of the transfer dynamics of k and g. Oh, sorry. See, so uh, single input, single output. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, so in general, you could have, you know, saying more than one output, more than one input. So, really that in, in the yeah. so the thing is that your system is J, no? and not the G, and the, you have a controller that modifies the. Input. Yeah, so the, so the controller will be something that modifies the dynamics, and we'll, we'll talk about this in, in, in five minutes. Okay. Um, and you correct, you know, like like the the output comparing it with a reference, no? Okay. Yeah, we'll see how this works, but it, but just this is just a kind of algebra exercise. Only algebra. Okay.
Um, yeah, so, so there is, I mean, they're, they're equivalent. They're just showing yes. things differently. So the, the, the Boda plot is just the frequency response plot, I think we would call it. So it's just explicitly plotting the magnitude and the phase function of frequency. Um, the, the whole zero plot is just, uh, uh, plotting the, um, Positions of the complex poles of G of S. So, mm -hmm. so I'm probably doing that. The imaginary axis is a frequency, more or less. Oh, the pole zero plot? Yeah. Um, is it frequency? Yeah, more or less. I mean, if it, you could say it's, yeah, yeah. And, if we, and then, and then the, 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 the imaginary part would be the, 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 the frequency, and then the real part would be the damping. <laughs> Done the, the zero, uh, the zero pole first, uh, where we find uh, the the pole of the zero poles. The poles. So they have the change from the pole. The yeah. So the so in physics, so 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 um, kind of some theoretical physics text, particularly like in in, in particle theory, would would plot the complex Fourier transform. So it would be the complex omega plane. And then the poles would be in the upper half or lower half of the plane, depending on the sign convention. I think usually it's defined as the stable ones are in the lower half and the unstable in the upper half. I think. No, I forget. I, the other way around. I, I got lost. <laughs> oh, so if you if you define the comp for you trans complex for you transform, which people like in many body theorem stuff often do. They would define a complex omega and then talk about the poles in the omega plane and then the stable ones i think are in the lower half and then stable in the upper half but it might be the reverse it might be the stable in the upper half and then yeah, the 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 it, i mean it just depends on whether the you take a plus omega i omega or minus i omega in the forward versus the reverse so you know, it's just the convention okay so um how, how are we doing on uh the block diagrams is there, Maybe there's a volunteer. Is there a volunteer to give the solution? Let's try. I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Is it up here or is it back? Did you get a, did she get a fresh page? Or? Yeah, fresh page. Okay. Or just a reverse it. Oh. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, you mentioned that the Western Revolution, uh, you, yeah, you, you haven't heard the work out there. But uh, is it that the uh, input K was kind of losing? Right. I'm just So that you had a condition that this by multiplying the, the test print point, and you want to find the expression for Y. And I. And I thought that Y was the condition of E and U. Mm -hmm. And then you sort of just put this in here where you add that E of S is R minus R of S minus uh, Y of S. And then you end up yeah. with anyway. Yeah, so, you, so among friends, after you've written all of that, you could probably drop the S's just to yes, make it simpler. <laughs> I mean, every, everything is implicitly a function of S then. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I was confused with the R at the beginning, but the R and uh, yes, and then you, when you plug it in, you end up with, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> and equal to B, J, R, over one, two, three, okay? Yep, that's right. Okay, is that uh, reasonable to people? Uh, 
it looks kind of like we're doing yeah. dynamics so we just add components of the system yeah. okay so uh yeah so 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 exactly that um and um yeah, so it's just it's just uh, uh, keeping track of these various things and doing the algebra and and you have the y coming up in two places, so that's why you get a non-trivial denominator. So we can we can just give this a new name and call it t of s, which would be like the closed loop transfer function, or it has an official name in control theory of the complementary sensitivity function, but that's probably not so useful. Um, but it, it it tells you how to go from 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 a reference to the output. When you have control, so so the thing to contrast is that by putting in this feedback loop, we now have this dynamics T of S connecting R and Y. Whereas if if we didn't have this loop and we just applied R directly into a system and didn't have any of this stuff, it would be R applied to G would be you know Y equals GR. So you can think of adding a feedback loop as changing the dynamics from this G of S to some other dynamics. Which hopefully are are nicer in some in some way. Um, one thing to notice is that so G is your system and K is your controller. So G is kind of set by the system that you have, but K you have some uh, uh, freedom to choose. And for example, if K were some kind of constant or had an overall constant, notice that if um, K gets very large compared to G, then T goes to one. Right. And if T were one, that would be kind of nice because then R would then Y would just be R. And R is in some sense what you want Y to be, right? That's the reference that you would like your system to do. So in some sense, we've it looks like we've solved our problem by by having something where we let K become very large. Okay. So let's see how that goes. Um, so if K is just a constant. This is something called a strategy called proportional control. And it's called proportional control because the feedback signal U or the, 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 the output of the feedback controller U is just proportional to the E. Now, one should remember that if, if we define the error kind of in a more natural way, there, there would be a negative sign here. And this would be Y minus R instead of R minus Y. So this is negative feedback, but because negative feedback is stabilizing for a system, it's kind of the, 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 the standard case, I guess. And so that's why often it's, it's, it's defined, the error is defined backwards. So you just don't have negative signs everywhere. But, but really, what you think of is the, 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 the feedback is, is in the opposite direction from the error. Yes. Yeah. Just a question, what does this uh, Y minus R plus function real space adjust the of the future? What this Okay, actually looks like oh, sorry. So it's it's the difference of the uh, uh, output from the reference. So so just yeah, think of it in the context. Right? Yeah, but if you just wondering what this would look like in a, in a real system, we're not in this. But just the same, right? You, if you take the Laplace trans, if you take the inverse Laplace transform, ah, yeah, this would just get back to R of T, yeah. 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 the Y of T minus R. Of T. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it's the product that gets trickier because then one yeah. becomes a convolution. But for some, it's just some. Mm -hmm. So if uh, uh, so, let's let, let's look at this for a first order system. So this is the RC filter circuit that I talked about, for example. Um, uh, and so, what does T of S look like? Well, it's, it's G K over one plus G K. If we divide through by the G Ks, it's one over one plus G K inverse. G inverse is just one plus S. Uh, uh, K is just this K proportional KP. So it's, it's, it's one over one plus S over KP. Um, and if I rearrange terms, I've got a constant here and an S term here. So this is also a first order linear system. Um, it's a new system that still has first order dynamics, but now, Instead of going to, to zero, it will go um, you know, at, at, at low frequencies. So this is the long time dynamics, S is zero. And so we just have um, we just have one over this, which which is is kp over kp plus one. And indeed, if you were to set kp to infinity, um, this would just be one. And so then again we would have a transfer function t 
uh, equal to one in the long time limit. Um, uh, and I have plotted that here. So this is the, the y infinity is a function of kp. And so as kp gets large, this becomes one. And so the output is following the input. And the, the dynamics, it's s over kp, which corresponds to speeding up the dynamics by a factor of kp. So if the, remember, we've scaled everything by some time constant tau. And so the new dynamics has a time constant that is tau divided by kp. So it's faster. So in a way, we have a system that responds faster and goes more and more towards the value that we want to command it. So again, setting kp to be at some very large number seems like we will have solved our problem and you know, made our first order system behave like a much faster first order system that is following much more closely the, the command signal. Sorry, I didn't get, I mean, I, I don't know how to interpret this graph of why, like, I don't know what is the mean of the output output to be one or zero and could you repeat that so 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 um so y is equal to uh let's see let's go back here so so um y is t of s times r so where, where are we uh, right here okay 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 and so so we're looking at what t is yeah so if t okay. is one then y is just following r is the same y is equal to the same r, and and in and in in the time domain y of t is equal to r of t. Okay. Okay. So that's a perfect controller because whatever you command it on the input, it does on the output. Okay. So, um, you know, again, think of this room and the temperature of the room, and that's that's the y. Okay. And the r is what you want the temperature of the room to be. Mm -hmm. So, okay, the temperature of the room is a little more complicated than a first order system, but to the extent that it's acting like a first order system, we would say, well, I want the temperature in the room to do this over the day. And so you would put that in as your R of T and then the Y of T would, would instantly follow it. Of course, we know that that doesn't quite happen, mm -hmm. um, but we'll get to that, I hope in a moment. Um, okay, so um, however, for a finite value, we'll, we'll show in a moment that, you know, taking KP to infinity or very, very large sounds like a perfect solution. And the way I'm setting things up, you you might suspect that it doesn't always work out so simply. And so we'll come to that in a moment. Um, but if you set KP at a finite value, then the Y is always, the T is always less than one. Okay. And, and you can think about this intuitively in the temperature example that I just gave. So if the control is really um, proportional to the difference between, to, to, to the error. So the difference between the set point and the actual temperature, then if that, if, if you have perfect control, then the error is zero. But if the error is zero, the heater is off. And if the heater is off, the room cools down. So the heater has to be on to keep the room at a certain temperature. Um, but then it can't be, if there was just proportional control, it can't be on. So it settles at an equilibrium or can settle at an equilibrium that is just below where the error multiplied by the KP is enough to keep the heater at the right level. So that's called proportional droop. And the, the larger KP is, the less of it there is because a small error multiplied by a large number will, will be a moderate heater value, okay? But for any finite value of gain, the actual temperature would have to be a little bit lower. And so that's a defect of proportional control. And one way, a strategy that can get around it is called integral control. And the idea is that instead of making the feedback proportional to the error, you make it proportional to the integral of the error. You can think of this as sort of saying, well, you know, maybe if I looked at the behavior of the system, I could understand how much heater value is needed to keep it at the right temperature and just empirically determine that from, from how much it, it has been heating and use that as your signal. So mathematically, what this means is like, if we have our first order system, and I'll do it in the time domain here, um, so y dot is, is, is minus y, and then we add something that's proportional to the integral of the error, where the error again is, let's say r is just a constant minus y of t. So we put that in, and the thing to notice is that now when the temperature is stationary, the stationary solution where this is zero just has y equal to, to r. To analyze this in frequency space using our transfer functions, um, 
we would have the integral is, is corresponds to one over S, the inverse of a derivative. Okay. And we're, we're almost done, almost okay. done. That's, that's, this, this is the subtle signal to, yes, to yes. speed up. Um, so it has a, a, a transfer hundred K over, K over S. If we put in our first order system here, then T following this recipe, uh, we, just, we just put it in, but here we've got, instead of a constant, we have S over KI. And so if you look at this now, this is a second order system. So um, when S equals zero, and we look at the DC response, it indeed goes to one. So the time, the stationary solution is exactly what we want, but it's at the cost of turning a first order system into a second order system. And you'll notice as you increase the gain, which I call KI for integral, then <clears throat> increasing the gain is like decreasing the damping and it will make it start to oscillate. So instead of now relaxing, it will start to, to wander around like that. So the feedback has turned a first order system into a second order system in closed loop. And here that's not such a good thing. On the other hand, it has the advantage of going to the solution that you really want and not having to have an offset. Um, so um, this integral control, this property of, of making a solution go to a desired value uh, pops up a famous application of this in chemotaxis um, where Stan Leibler and Nama Barkai about in 97 um, analyzed you know, what makes uh, 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 the attraction of, of, a, of a, a system to a chemical gradient, the same over all sorts of different gradients. And, and it turns out to involve integral control. Um, but just to get back to where we were, you can try to combine some of the advantages of proportional control and integral control by having a transfer function that is both. So we'll call this PI control. So now the transfer function is K of S is a constant plus something one over S. And if you um, compute its closed loop transfer function, so the, 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 the response, the, 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 the Boda plot of the controller now looks like this. So in proportional control would be just like this, integral control is one over S like that, and this has both. Now you have two parameters to play with, and you can still have uh, um, T is equal to one for long times, but now we can take KP and it appears here in the damping term, and get rid of this oscillatory response. So this problem that I said that you have a second, you turn a first order system into a second order system which will oscillate in its response, that can go away. Um, so you can, you can keep going and add in a third term which is proportional to the derivative of, of the error. And this, is, this gives you PID control, which is kind of a standard industrial control or for an experimental, like if you're an experimentalist and you have to control a variable, this is what you'll probably be using. And the derivative term kind of anticipates, you know, you see the error changing. And so you can sort of anticipate that there's been a big perturbation and you'll have to do something to correct for it. So in some sense, you can get the jump on it and, and start correcting for it before the perturbation happens. The problem is that if you also have noise, sometimes that jump in error could just be a noisy jump. And so that's a problem that we'll have to deal with later. But if you didn't have so much noise, then that's a good strategy. So this PID control is, is simple, but now we have three parameters for proportional gain, integral gain, and differential gain. And one of the things you would say is, well, how do you choose the values? Well, PID control is simple enough that you can actually more or less do this intuitively, and there's some heuristic rules. But when you get to more complicated kinds of controller, then you have more parameters to tune and you need something more systematic. And one method is called optimal control. And I hope on Wednesday we'll get to that. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave with just maybe a, 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 a sketch and I'll, I'll, I'll put the, I guess we're going to post notes or something, or I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can. okay, so I can post notes. So I'll have this part of the notes there. But, um, uh, you know, I sort of at, said that, you know, just having a proportional controller with infinite gain seemed to be the solution to our problems. And, and in fact, what happens in a physical system is if you make the proportional gain too high, it almost always starts to oscillate spontaneously. Um, and to understand where this comes from, let's go back to our, our control loop. But let's add now a sensor. And the sensor here actually is gonna be not have any dynamical properties except for adding a delay. Okay, so it's, you know, the, 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 the system and 
the controller, our physical distance away, there's at least the speed of light, but other things can add delays as well. And so now, if you analyze this feedback loop, it turns out to be kg over one plus kg h. Okay, so there's an extra h in, in this loop part here. And if you, um, if you ask, well, what would, what would make this go unstable? Well, if kgh ever equals minus one, Right, then you have one minus one and it's, it's, it's zero, so it blows up. And so that corresponds, this linear response blowing up corresponds to being an unstable system. And so that happens, you, you know, if you go through and analyze this uh, uh, system, and, and I have the analysis here, this happens at a finite value of the gain. So when the gain gets to a point, which actually, when, when you work it out, ends up being the ratio of the system time constant so how, how fast the system responds to the delay. So that ratio limits the gain that you can apply. So if you apply a higher gain, then the system will go unstable. And so if the delay is zero, then yes, you, you're allowed to have an infinite delay, but we know the speed of light is, is constant. So you don't have that. More realistically, you can um, look at this uh, uh, one dimensional rod that I talked about. Okay, with its funky transfer function, e to the negative square root of s over square root of s, and use it as the transfer function. So this is, this is now a, a, an extended system, and it doesn't really have delays, but faster temperature, you, 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 faster temperature uh, fluctuations take longer to diffuse, you know, longer to go from one point to another. Um, and this will also lead to uh, an instability. So you don't really have to have an actual mathematical, you know, rigid delay, but any, any extended physical system will be that. And, and, and true physical systems at high frequencies are always extended. Um, and so your temperature rod, um, you know, very low frequencies, you could describe temperatures as like capacitors and have a, have a thermal circuit that's like an electrical circuit, but at high frequencies, it, it, it doesn't work that way. Same thing for electrical circuits. Once the frequency gets to the uh, frequencies of order, the, the dimensions uh, um, divided by the speed of light, then that time becomes important. And then you have to think about delays going from one component to another. So there are always things that are kind of like delays in physical systems. And so there's always a limit to how much gain you can apply in, in this kind of feedback loop. Um, so that motivates being a little more sophisticated and going from proportional control to PID control is kind of a first step in sophistication, but it's, it's not by any means the last. And so um, we'll kind of continue on. I guess, I guess this is pretty much it for today. And so um, what I want to do tomorrow is go back, we'll still be in the linear systems and blah, 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 but go back to the time domain and, and talk about the time domain uh, in a little bit more detail and, and that, that'll be kind of our window to generalizing things in a, in a, in a nicer way. Okay. Thank you. Any, um, any, any last questions before we break for coffee and all? I'm just curious because I, I don't, I think the last time I was in the lab was in like the bachelor's degree. So, uh, is that, I mean, you, you are kind of modeling the response, no? The, I mean, the, yeah, like the, your control is not perfect, or is it takes some delay to control your physical system? No, no. I mean, that could be, that could be. Okay. That is a source of delay. Um, but what I was trying to say with this example of the of the rod, which which I think actually I, I you know there's there's I think in the notes here enough that you can work. It's, it's one of the problems that's worked out in my book and just the solution online. But um, the physical system itself has delays. Okay. If it's spatially extended, because if the yeah. input and the output are different spatial locations, yeah. then the signal takes some time to propagate. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's not a, it's not exactly a, a, a rigid delay. Uh -huh. Like you know, I was talking about earlier, but it's effectively like that. That the higher the frequency you go, the more phase shift there's going to be to get from one point to the other point. Okay. Okay. And so even within the physical system you're trying to control, there are delays, and that's what we're Of course, if you have other delays in your controller, of course that just makes it worse. 
And is that easy to model or? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, it can be easy to model, but in simple cases, it's easy to model. Okay. Cool. Yeah. There is one more. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> How do we uh, tackle with the diagnosis when we get counseling? I'm sorry. How do we handle the uh, diagnosis when we get counseling? Yeah, so so all of these, um, uh, how to say, all of these uh, non rational transfer functions that, that are not rational polynomials are described by. Um, and in fact, partial differential equation, or I mean, it could be delay differential, but you can convert a delay differential equation into a partial differential equation. But a partial differential equation can be linear and have a transfer function between two points. And so that's how you, so in frequency space, it's not a problem. So the transfer function, for example, here is, you know, this e to the negative square root of s over square root of s. And so that's that's all you need to do is, is, is find the Laplace transform connecting input and output, and then you can still use the same formula. Again, everything is linear and time independent. Once you play with that, it's, it's not so easy. I have a, like a, a, very, a little bit a technical question because I know that you were doing research on the Maxwell demos and these type of things, and you have to feed back, you have to measure the position of the particle in the trap, and then use this information to move the center, no, for example, of the part the trap. So I assume that you also have a delay in the measuring of the position and the transferring this information to the, the trap center. How, how does it affect to the to the experiment? Only in the gain that you achieve, or I mean, that's one effect. If you, I mean, if your goal were trying to control it, that would limit you. Um, it affects it there. I mean, this is the stuff that we'll be talking about on Thursday and Friday, but it affects it by limiting. Um, I mean, if, if there's a delay between the information you acquire and the action that you take, then you're acting kind of on old information, and so there's more uncertainty. But we kind of, yeah, and so we need we need to introduce stochastic effects into the equations to describe it. So that'll happen starting Thursday and Friday. That'll be Thursday. And Friday. Okay, okay, okay. But so having a long delay, it's uh, it's like it's like I mean we can say that uh, to be have more noise, no, in your in our system, no. Having more delay implies more noise, more uncertainty, more uncertainty. More uncertainty. More uncertainty. More I mean the noise is always there, but you're uncertain yeah, about what it means. So more uncertainty. uncertainty. Yeah. So in the language that I started with, the system in some sense is, is open loop. It's not being controlled while there's a delay. Yeah. Okay. And so then it, it'll behave as the open loop system happens. And, and if there's some uncertainty and you describe it by some distribution, then that distribution will sort of broaden. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. For the sake of time, we have to stop here, break, and then we continue with the lecture on the meeting. Okay. Let's break, John. Thank you.